This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. Welcome to the show. With this podcast, I share a variety of stories from the most well-known dynasty of them all, the Tudors. From simple stories about the people of the time to the drama that was the reign of Henry VIII. And of course, politics. This show is presented to you commercial-free thanks to my wonderful patrons. If you'd like to help, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Dynasty and click become a patron. For as little as $1 per month, you can show your support. Okay, so I honestly don't know very much about Charles Brandon, but here's what I do know. I know that his father was a standard bearer for King Henry VII, and he died at the Battle of Bosworth. I know that he was good friends with Henry VIII, and that he was married a few times and secretly wed the king's sister. Okay, so maybe I know a little bit more than that, but I would rather have today's guest tell you. Sarah Bryson is the author of Lorraine Blanche, Mary Tudor, A Life in Letters, and she has an amazing Facebook page with all kinds of interesting bits of history. You might also recognize Sarah's name as a frequent guest on Tudor blogs, including TudorsDynasty.com. But what is most exciting is that Sarah will be publishing a book in 2020 called In the Shadow of Kings, The Brandon Men. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Well, I'd like to start off our conversation by discussing the Ron Blanche just a little bit. <laughs> okay, maybe a little bit more than a little bit. But you did such an amazing job putting that book together that it really left me as a reader feeling like I stepped back in time. Thank you so much. Um yeah, Mary's been a passion of mine for quite a while now, so it's amazing to hear that that passion has gotten into my book. It definitely has. So what made you decide to write about Mary? I think for me, Mary is one of the overlooked Tudor personalities of the court. Um, I wanted to learn more about this woman. You know, she's got such an interesting story. At at 18, she's married to a 52-year-old king, old and wrinkly. But her story doesn't really start there. It's sort of starts after he dies three months after the wedding and uh, she secretly marries the love of her life and it it seems like such a fairy tale Um, but she was actually the maker of her own story and she was very much in charge of her own life and um, yeah I'm just really really passionate about her. I I can relate um, you know finding a a character I say character but that's just what I'm going to call it a character in Tudor history that you know you look at and you just admire and you you want you want to learn more how long did it take you to research that book took me about two years um lots of delving into archival material and translating letters so yeah about two years all up wow and that's it's a lot of work. I mean, when it, you're when you're doing it, nonfiction, it is a lot it of is. work. It is. It is. And I I actually do work full time at another job. So this is sort of my passion that I squeeze in around work and family as well. So yeah, like so many of us, isn't that, <laughs> isn't that the truth? It is. <laughs> so here here's a good question I have for you because I people ask me this question all the time about Thomas Seymour. What did you learn from your research on Mary that surprised you? I think the main thing that I learned is that Mary was, she was a master manipulator. She was this woman that was one of the most beautiful women in all of Europe. She had all the classic skills, you know, required of of, um, a noble woman at the time. Yet she had her brother wrapped around her finger. She used the power of her letters to put ideas in Henry's mind of things that she wanted, Um, but she wrote them in such a way that he would think that they're his ideas, and then he would suddenly come up with this idea, and she'd be like, oh, Henry, what a fantastic idea you had. (laughs) She was just, she was just very incredible at sort of um, uh, maneuvering the men in her life to lead the life that she wanted and I think that's I think that's really powerful for an, a, a time when women are seen as repressed with no voice mm-hmm. um, 
Mary used that one skill that she really was very good at, and that was writing letters, um, to, to get what she wanted. And ultimately, that was to marry the man that she wanted to marry, not a man that her brother chose or that the kingdom chose for her, to marry the man that she wanted. I You definitely have to respect her for that. But, you know, being how repressed women were back Absolutely. then to be yep. able to find a way to have her voice heard and to be able to control the situation to get to get the end result that she wanted. That's amazing. Absolutely. I mean, ultimately, marrying Charles Brandon, um, that was treason. She didn't she didn't seek the king's permission, formal permission anyway. And um, he could have been killed. Uh, She could have been married off to some other European prince, but she manoeuvred the situation through her letters to marry the man that she wanted to marry. So I think that's that's really powerful in in that time. I I agree. Do you think um, her and Charles felt the same about each other? Were they both equally in love with one another? I think I, I definitely think there was love there. I think there was respect. I think she was probably more in love with Brandon than he was with her. Um, Not to say that he wasn't in love with her, but I mean, he'd be a fool not to, not -hmm. to look at a situation and and gobble it up as he did. Um, But oh, I mean, people think that he just used her, uh, that they were married for 18 years and the marriage only ended due to her death. Um, Charles, in his life, fathered only one illegitimate child that we can officially record. Um, We we don't even know when that child was born. It it could have been during the marriage or it could have been before. Mm -hmm. So we we, we just, you know, there's not even a strong case for infidelity in the marriage. He was very dedicated to her. He, when she um, argued against Anne Boleyn and Henry's marriage to Anne, he he actually um, dared to stand up and um, agree, which, you know, cost him a lot. Um, of course, he came slithering back and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you, you know, there, there were times and we have um, we have two letters from Brandon that he actually wrote to Henry about Mary when she was very sick. And they're quite emotive letters. Um sort of and you could really feel that he is really worried and concerned about her so I I genuinely think there were strong feelings between them I, and I hate to keep bringing up Thomas Seymour but there's a lot of similarities between the mm. two couples and that Thomas people also thought that the only reason why he married Catherine was for power and mm. you know for money and uh, I, I see it's it's very similar to Mary and Charles as well absolutely yeah definitely you know, I think I think the important thing is that the surface story isn't always the true story and you have to delve deeper into things like letters, um, you know, letters written by the people themselves or letters written by other people about the people, uh, you know, to find out what really is going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speaking of letters, you know, when you can find a letter that was written in the hand Mm. of your favorite historical figure, it is so exciting. And if you can read it, (laughs) it's even more exciting. In my case, uh, Thomas's handwriting is atrocious. So so that hasn't helped me much. But just even to be able to look at it and say, wow, he wrote this. Absolutely. I mean, Charles Brandon was known in his time to be the worst at his handwriting it is just ridiculously <laughs> bad i mean nothing is ever spelt it um, obviously they they didn't have sort of the english language as we had it now and everything right. was very phonetic and brandon seems to have um quite a strong east anglian accent <laughs> and uh, uh my favorite is that he calls thomas cromwell thomas cromwell I just love the idea that he's Cromwell. I just think that's so funny. But I mean, even even someone's name is never spelt the same more than twice. It's just it's just an atrocious handwriting. So many, right. many long hours have been scrolling through these letters trying to work out what the man was saying. 
Um, but I think I've got him down now, so that's all good. <laughs> now, back to Mary a little bit. When you were researching her life, you know, that book, that was all letters mm-hmm. between the two of them. Do you remember how many letters that you actually looked at? I do. Um, I actually looked at, in my book, there's actually 26 of Mary's letters or part of her letters. But I've also included 57 letters or part thereof um, written about Mary. So what I find so interesting is that so much was written about her, um, talking about what she was doing, where she was, um, things she said and did. So yeah, so there's over 80 letters that she either wrote wow. or that are about her. So it's a fascinating wealth of information that has, you know, been overlooked for so long that I really felt we have these first-hand documents. Let's let's read them. Let's bring them to life. Did you feel like the letters helped you to oh, come up abs- with your story? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can read you can read what someone says um, and you can read information but to actually read what a person is thinking and feeling it's it's almost it's it's as close as you can get to be there in the room having a conversation with them Um, it 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 gives a real insight into the person and what their mindset at the time so yeah there's unless we find a hidden diary or something it's about as close as we're ever going to get to yeah no that would be amazing (laughs) i keep my fingers crossed every day but you know (laughs) oh man that would be so if if every single person Uh, at tutor court kept a diary that would be i would just love it but then charles brandon was never much of a writer so it would probably be atrocious and and mary's would probably be very very long with many volumes i'd imagine (laughs) You know, you talked about Charles Brandon's handwriting and one of the mm. my favorite things that you do on your Facebook page is guess the word. Yes. And yes. do you just do you do that once a week or am I missing some? No, no, I try to do it. Yeah, just once a week. It's just a fun little game to play. I randomly pick one of Charles Brandon's atrocious words and get people to try and guess it without any context. So it's all a bit of fun. It Sometimes- is a lot. Yeah, sometimes people are really, really good. And then sometimes I'll throw one in there that, you know, will completely stump people. So, yeah, it's lots of fun. It it takes some practice to figure Absolutely. out what yeah. words they're trying. And once you get it, it makes it so much easier to read more. And then it's like reading, you know, the standardized spelling that we have now. It's like Absolutely. reading that. Yeah, as uh, every now and then I'll find out, find when I'm typing something or writing something, I will revert to um, using Fs for Ss or, you know, adding extra vowels when I really shouldn't. And I think, nope, I'm in the modern time. I need to write the correct way. Yes. Yeah. I, I have, the, it's funny because I recently told my husband that my spelling has gotten so bad in the last year. <laughs> and I feel it's like because I'm reading yeah, all of this I, spelling. Absolutely, completely agree with you. You know, if we could all just sort of spell phonetically and write however we wanted, it would be fantastic. But. It would. <laughs> so, you did the book on on Mary Tudor, and in yes. the book you talked about, you know, her relationship with Charles Brandon, and yes. you know, you have this obsession with both Mary and Charles. Everybody who has followed me for any amount of time, obviously, again, knows that I'm have an obsession with Thomas Seymour, and I think it's because I have always felt like he was unjustly vilified. Yes. Yeah. With that in mind, why did you choose your second book to be about the Brandon men? Well, I've actually been researching Charles Brandon and his family history for about 10 years now. Um, Brandon is is my passion. He, I am fascinated with this man. I, I can't understand how someone who was Henry VIII's best friend, brother-in-law, such a prominent member in the Tudor court, such a prominent member in Tudor England, has had so little recognition. This this concept just blows my mind. He's a fascinating man. And I just have a passion to write about him. And 
there's, as you said with um, Thomas, there's so many misconceptions about the Brandons that Charles Brandon came from a poor family. He came from nowhere. He's, his only family achievement was that his father fought for Henry VII at Bosworth and, and ultimately died. Um, and that launched his whole career. A and while his, fa his father did die that way, the rest is completely inaccurate. So I really want to get the truth about the Brandons out there for the world to read and learn the truth about this fascinating family. I love that. I respect that because I, mm -hmm. I can relate to it. Like we need the truth to come out. Absolutely. And I love that in the modern day and age now that we have so many resources that are disposable uh, at our disposal online. You know, you mm -hmm. can yeah. you can find so many documents online for free that you don't necessarily have to travel to England to begin your research. No. Uh, you recently no. went to England, though, did you not? I did. I spent a month in England and two weeks of that was dedicated to uh, doing some talks, but research, just just research, research. Um, I visited the grave where Charles Brandon's two younger sons are buried. Oh. Um, I visited the church where um, Brandon's uh, grandfather and one of his uncles is buried and um, just to be in this building and know these two remarkable, incredible men are there and there's no recognition. There's no, you know, it's been completely paved over. There's no no monument or anything. It's just, it's a very powerful feeling. Um, and obviously I visited Charles Brandon's grave again uh, for the <laughs> manyth time, um, Mary's grave. But just to, to walk in the footsteps of these men, um, I visited Caister Castle, which is a place that uh, William Brandon Sr. Um, was, uh, just to stand there and to know that he walked here and he was here. It's just, it really, it helps to put you in the mindset of the people that you're writing about. Um, so yes, if, if you do have the opportunity to travel anytime, I strongly recommend it. I can't even imagine, you know, I was recently talking to Dr. Sarah Morris about this yes, and yep. she's going to be going to Sudley Castle. I think she said this weekend and she knows yes. I told, she's like, what would you yeah. do the first time you go to Sudley? And I'm like, I'm going to kiss the wall and I'm probably going to cry because it's well, going to be so emotional. I have a fun little uh, fact that about Sudley that ties in uh, Thomas and uh, Mary Tudor. Uh, an original portrait uh, of Mary Tudor actually hangs at Sudley Castle. Is, uh, this, is this the one where it looks like she's wearing purple? Yes, by uh, Corvus. Um, this incredible oil on, on a panel painting of her sort of from the waist up hangs there. And I, I, I knew that it was uh, when I visited and I didn't know where it was. And I turned the corner and there she was. And I, I broke down in tears just oh. to see this original that she would have seen. She would have, you know, touched. She would have, mm -hmm. it would have hung, you know, where she would have seen it. It was just, it was breathtaking just to be so close. And the way I like to think of it is the only thing that separated us was time, you know, time. Right. But yeah, so there's a fun little connection that oh, ties Mary it. and Thomas together. So, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I liked you before, but now I like you even more. <laughs> <laughs> so, it certainly is amazing. It's such a beautiful place. I mean, it's so stunning. And they really, I mean, there's this whole section for children now. So I went with my family and they put up with me while I sort of geeked out on the history <laughs> side. And then they went and had fun in, in the kid play section so yeah that, it's, that's it's, great and they're they're doing a big dig out there right now aren't they yes I know so is, that's so exciting I actually have been in contact with the historian that I believe is in charge of the dig and he sent me a picture of tile that they found and said imagine this could be the tile that Thomas walked on and I was by myself when I read the email and I think I squealed because I thought oh my gosh this is so amazing I, uh, I have a, a fun little, another fun little thing along the same lines. Um, Charles Brandon built uh, Westhorpe Hall, 
which was a, uh, a beautiful, huge manor in East Anglia. Um, and in the sort of early 19th century, it was demolished. Um, and I know the, the, the people that own um, the building on it now. And obviously I visited and he took me to a shed. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> and he, he pulled out this big crate and it was uh, terracotta from the building that Charles Brandon had built that he lived in. And so to touch to touch that was just the most amazing thing um, to know that these pieces that I were holding, you know, was 500 or so years old and he had organised the design and he had lived there and seen these pieces. So, yes, I, I completely agree with you. <laughs> it is just the most amazing feeling. It makes me wonder if during Tudor times, if there were people like us who were as obsessed with history, if they had, mm -hmm. you know, people from the past that they felt so strongly about like we do, or is it because we have such easy access to this stuff now? I don't know. Well, I know in his early years, Henry VIII was, you know, very much into the Arthurian legend, you know, of King Arthur and the knights. So, right. I think, oh, yeah, I think perhaps there might have been a little bit of uh, uh, admiring back then as well. Yeah, they just didn't have podcasts and blogs. Um, and Yeah, or easy <laughs> access to all these books and uh, right. <laughs> documents. <laughs> so, Sarah, I remember um, when I watched The Tudors, um, which really, you know, and people sometimes will bash the show, but it was really something that inspired me to want to learn more about them. Yeah, I, yeah. I remember when I watched them that in the show, Charles Brandon was like a trusted military leader for Henry VIII. Now, yes. When I said at the beginning, I know that his father was a standard bearer for Henry the Seventh. Um, yes. Was royal service something that had been in the family longer than Charles and his father? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, so the Brandons uh, date back to the reign of Henry the Sixth, and they had always been closely tied to England's kings. Um, obviously, they flourished and came to more attention under Henry the seventh um, Charles Brandon's uncles both of his uncles were knighted in battle like just after the battle by Henry the seventh um, his grandfather uh, was knighted after the Battle of Tewkesbury, which again I went to the site where the Battle of Tewkesbury was held and to walk on these fields and know that William Brandon fought there, risked his life there for Edward IV was was an incredible feeling. Uh, so, yeah, their military service, um, they've always served England's kings. Um, even Richard III, um, although, you know, they ultimately hedged their bets and went multiple different ways. So <laughs> who, whoever won, the Brandons would come out on top. Um, and that's something that I you know, I think is such a powerful, we always have the Stanleys, the Stanleys, hedge yes. their bets, you know, but the Brandons were doing it long before the Stanleys and the Brandons had more uh, men to do it with. So one son would go with this king, one son would go with this person and the grandfather would go into sanctuary. And so, yeah, they were always very closely aligned to England's kings and fought for them. Well, I I hope that this podcast is is going to help some people realize a little bit more about the family mm. before your book comes out, so that they really so. you know they'll want to learn more and to understand the the family a little bit better. Absolutely, uh, they weren't just poor peasants that came from nowhere. Uh, William Brandon uh, Senior, it was the sort of the patriarch of the family, and he was an incredibly smart man very savvy with money but not always the best savvy let's just say he perhaps uh, twisted the law a little bit from time to time shall we say I'll be honest uh, he was a very very wealthy man um, and and this misconception that they came from nothing is is just not true it's absolutely not true they were a very wealthy family uh, 
Thomas Brandon was um, Henry VII's master of the horse, which was one of the three highest posts in the court at the time and a very trusted position. Um, you know, we have at Elizabeth's, Elizabeth the first time, we have Dudley becoming her master of the horse. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we all know about that. So it, he was a trusted man and uh, people that just come from nowhere uh, don't always, you know, get to the positions that the Brandons did. So I think there's a lot more to them than people think. I love it. I love it. Well, Sarah, why don't you let everybody know, first of all, um, talk about your your two books, um, where they can get your book about Mary, and then tell them um, if they're interested in following you, where they can follow you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my book's just available on Amazon. So if you just type in uh, Sarah Bryson. My um, book on Mary will be available there. Uh, I also have a website, um, www.sarah-bryson.com. Um, and you can find me on Facebook as well. And it's just Sarah Bryson there as well. So I'm all over the place. <laughs> and, and what I will do as well, Sarah, is I will include the links to your Facebook, to Amazon, um, you. to your website and all of that. So that if anybody's interested, they can just click the link and go check it out. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you, Sarah, so much for being on the show today. It was a pleasure talking to you, and hopefully we can do it again in the future. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Wait a second, you didn't think I'd actually forget to thank my patrons, did you? It's because of these wonderful people that the show is currently commercial free, and without their generosity, probably wouldn't exist. Now, if you'd like to become a patron of my podcast, just go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tutors Dynasty, and click Become a Patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support. Now, I have one new patron since the last episode, so I'd like to give a shout out to Rebecca H. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Now, I'd like to thank all my other patrons, Adrian S., Angela G.A., Anna K., Ann L., Azaria J., Bob W., Carrie H., Cheryl T., Courtney D., Cynthia Y.R., Diana O.E., Diane B, Donna Marie K, Doris C, Heather T, Heidi H, James V, Jen, Jennifer V, Joy B, Catherine R, Catherine K, Katie F, Lacey W, Lara L, Lisa N, Mary J, Mary T, Megan B, Melissa S, Michelle T, Nicole T, Nora C, Rachel C D, Rebecca H, Sarah C, Sari G, Shelby H, Sue K, Stacy C, Tanya R, and Wendy A. Whew. You guys, I'm always blown away at how many of you are patrons of the show. And like I said, for as little as a dollar a month, it means so much to me. So thank you again for joining the show today. Until next time.